us for now? No? Okay, if no, then we will continue. And this is where you've got to get yourself uh, ready, buckle up your seat belt, okay? Number one, we're going to look at the overall layout first. Now, we notice this is the overall picture. There was a large courtyard that was open to the sky. Huh? You can see here it's all open air. Huh? All right. And surrounded by a fence that is made of white color linen and curtains. Okay. You can see there are white color linen and there's curtain here. There's an entrance curtain. Okay. Where you can enter it. And they were hung from pillars. You can see pillars. There are a lot of sockets. There are a lot of hooks on the floor and fillets. Okay. Inside that courtyard is the tabernacle. Which, what, which is what we also call the tent of the Lord, the tent of meeting, the sanctuary. But also inside the courtyard and outside the tabernacle itself, which is this compound, you will see that there is a brazen altar, okay, very big, very imposing. The first thing you will see is the brazen altar. You won't miss it. Okay? And then there's a, bra there's a bronze lever here. It's a basin, a big basin. Lever means basin, huh? to wash hands one. Huh? And then the inside of the tabernacle itself also consists two parts, which later we were going to see, okay? The larger portion, which is in front of it, almost two-thirds of it, is called the holy place. And the smaller portion, which is behind, all right, uh, one-third of it, is what we call the most holy place, or sometimes also called the holy of holies. It's like the holiest of everything, the most holy place. And we will consider the various parts in order, and so we can only touch on seven main items tonight, okay? Uh, actually, there are far more, but we're going to touch on only seven main items. The first thing first we're going to look at is the fence. The fence, all right? This the fence. So the priest would approach the fence of the outer courtyard, which demonstrates the visible, very visible, you can see one, that God is separated. Okay, remember what is the word separation? Remember last week we learned about that word. What is that word? What is the word that we always use, which we only know we usually mean, okay, purity. But there's another aspect of it. What is that word? That word is holiness, correct? Holy, huh? That this is one of God's main, very main attribute. God is holy. So immediately you see the tabernacle, immediately you are being reminded. That God is separated. God is holy. Separated, right? Now, separated doesn't mean that he wants to be distant. It doesn't mean that. But he means that he is different. He is set apart. He is holy from his people. And the person that will come into this sacred place, so this place immediately becomes sacred. This place immediately becomes like Sinai. Remember Sinai? God says what? Don't let any cattle or human beings to come near the mountain, remember? So this is um, immediately you see that, right? The same picture. So he would pass by the gate here, here, this gate, the curtain. And this curtain is made of blue, purple, scarlet, white. Blue, purple, scarlet, and white. Huh? A little bit like France, uh, the, the flag of France, except um, they don't have purple. Huh? So this is one more color. Um, curtains that are connected to the four pillars of brass. Four pillars of brass. One, two, three, four. These are made of brass. And with brass socket that's on the floor and the silver hooks and clubs. Okay? So these place, these curtains are like that. And then you come in. As you pass by through the gate, the first thing that this person will see is the bronze altar. The bronze altar. So it will be very immediate before him. And then he would approach that bronze altar. And the square altar with four horns on the corner, it looks something like this, okay, the four horns. So this is the courtyard, okay, so this is where the gate is. You come in, you will see this bronze altar, a square one, okay, you come nearer, you will see something like this, there's horns on it, and there's a, this, uh, these things that is the bar, huh? the bar that goes through it. So it would be immediately that. Now the square altar with four horns on the corner were covered in bronze. It would have been very beautiful, but it would also have been more, you know, uh, more durable. If you use gold, uh, you use gold, uh, it will not be so durable, but you use bronze, uh, it will be this. Um, it was accompanied by bronze pans. There will be pans on it, and there will be shovel, there will be fork on it. A little bit looked like a very, very huge barbecue pit. 
all right? Uh, we are told that the fire on the altar is never allowed to go out. So you will always have to keep the fire burning, burning, burning. There. Even though you have nothing to place on it, you must still burn. Now, in order for a holy God, so you can see now, if, if it's always burning there, that means it's quite heat, now, now, producing heat. Now, all right? And in the midst of a, of a, of a, 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 a hot day now, in, the, in, the, in the desert, now, okay, the heat is definitely felt. In the midst of night, uh, the cold desert, uh, the heat there uh, is also can be felt, can be seen. All right? So the first thing you will see here, in order for a holy God to dwell with his people, the first thing that is necessary is a sacrifice. There must be an atonement for sin. An atonement for sin. Okay, and what is the atonement? I told you before last time. Atonement means that you know, somebody or something that, re that's, that is representing the person that is uh, committing sin died for that person. Okay? So that is atonement or dying in the place of you. So therefore, the first thing that they come to is this bronze altar. So God's justice has to be satisfied. God justice over sin has to be satisfied. So confession of sin has to be made as you come in and come to the bronze altar, a substitute has to be provided for the atonement of sin. And the priest cannot go any further without this first step. Okay? I'm going to introduce to you a word that we call propitiation. Propitiation. Okay? P-R-O-P-I-T-I-A-T-I-O-N. P-R-O-P-I-T-I-A-T-I-O-N. Propitiation. Propitiation basically is the word for atonement, okay? Standing in the place, but especially used for turning away the wrath of God. Propitiation. So we will discuss the detail of the sacrifice next lesson. Uh, next lesson, we'll talk about the sacrifice. So we're not going to stop too long and talk about this. But this pointed to the need. There's a need, okay? For the final and perfect sacrifice of Christ. Why? Why? Because whatever that you place on it, it's not going to be perpetual. It's not going to be permanent. All right? But it is the first thing for approaching the Holy God. Atonement. Sacrifice. So this was pressed upon the mind of the people of God. They needed the sacrifice of Christ. A permanent sacrifice. Who can shed, only him can shed away his blood for the sin of his people. So without the substitutionary atonement, I talked about this many times, substitutionary atonement or atonement in representative or a, a representative, okay, through a representative, right? Without Christ's substitutionary atonement for all the sins of all his people, we would not have any access to approach God and there's no way for him to dwell with us. All right, say that again, eh? For God to dwell with us, for us to approach Him, there's no other way except for the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ for all the sins of all His people. Alright? Now that's the first item. The second item is what we say, what we call the bronze basin. You remember here you have the altar, right? You go back here, there's an altar, brazen altar. Then you go further, you will see a brazen lever or a bronze basin. Okay? Um, secondly, you will come to this bronze basin. It is made of solid bronze. That's why it's called brazen. It's used for ceremonial washing. It will have been filled with water inside that Aaron and his sons, okay, why Aaron and his sons? Because they are called to be the priests. They are appointed, the Levites are appointed as the tribe that serves as the priests. So they will wash themselves thoroughly. They will wash their hands and their feet before approaching the tent of tabernacle itself. And we are told that if they fail to wash and they went into the tabernacle, they would die. If they don't wash, they straight away go inside the tabernacle, they would die. So the next step after the sacrifice that symbolized ceremonially the need of washing or purification. After the sacrifice, after the atonement, you need to be washed. You need to be purified. The needed continual cleansing to enter into God's presence. So we see here that those who come to God through the sacrifice of Christ, they confess their sins already. They also need true cleansing, a spiritual cleansing. 
That's why in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, he says what? The blood of Jesus, his son, not just atone for us, but purifies us from all sin. There is a, an aspect of purification through the blood. So the blood does not just only forgive us our sins and make atonement, but it also purifies us. So the tabernacle itself, okay, now we come to the tabernacle. The tabernacle itself is actually in a rectangular shape, uh, long, elongated a bit. It's not square. And it is also covered in four layers of fabric, as you can see here, right? We purposely open up the layers. Actually, it's overlaying on each other. The bottom layer, you can see from the inside when you look up, it's a fine linen of blue, purple, scarlet, all right? And embroidered with pictures of cherubims and angels, okay? It's embroidery uh, with cherubims and angels that you can see from the inside, all right? Um, and then the outer layer, okay, the outer layer here, you've got the goat hair, and then the ram skin that is being dyed red, this is actually a ram skin, and then the outer layer here, this one, dark, dark one, is actually a layer of waterproof skins made from animal skin. Okay, once again, uh, this blue one uh, actually is a fine linen of blue, purple, and scarlet. Blue, blue, purple, and scarlet, and inside is embroidery, embroidered with pictures of cherubims and angels. Okay, cherubims and angels. All right, and then the outer layer, you will see here there is goat hair, ram skin that is being dyed red color here, and then the outer layer of waterproof skins. Okay, you, you can see here, you can also read from here, right? Here, okay. Now, when we enter through the curtain, here we enter, all these are curtain, you know, you, see, you can you see, you know, the pillar, huh? it's all curtain, all right? You enter the curtain, you go into the first chamber. The first chamber is this place. This one is the inner chamber. One and two is in the inner chamber. Uh, before you hit three, okay, all here is all the outer chamber, all right? Now, in the outer chamber, is called the holy place, the holy place, okay? Uh, this is the first section, and you will see the table of the showbread here. Later, I will show you a, a, a clearer picture here. There's a table. You will see the bread that is being put on there. Okay, the unleavened bread in the right side. And then the golden lampstand, this thing, is on the left side. All right? That is the only light source that is inside. And then the altar of incense here is in the middle of here. The middle, on the far side, immediately in front of the veil. This veil, after you pass this veil already, here now open for you, usually it's all covered up. Uh, after you pass this veil already, here is called the most holy place or the holy of holies. It's like the hot spot of the hot spot of the hot spot. Okay? Now, so first of all, if you went to your left, you would have come to the golden lampstand. I'm going to blow it up the picture so that you can see clearer. This is what the golden lampstand looked like. Okay? This was made of one solid piece of pure hammered gold. This entire thing uh, is not fixed from external one. The whole thing is made out of one piece. Uh, that is how it is supposed to be. All right? One solid piece. And it had a center column. You can see the center column here with three branches. One, two, three branches. Can you see the branch? Right? The branches, huh? And then it had a, uh, it is making a seven branch lampstand. One, two, three, four, five, six, and this seven. All right? So seven branch lampstand, similar to like a tree. It looks like a tree, isn't it? The lamps are supposed to be kept burning with oil perpetually. And what does it mean? It will illuminate, you know, it will shine the entire dark room. You can see the entire dark room, there's no light source in it. Nobody install any light, but the only light source is this golden lampstand that's supposed to shine through everything here. All right? So, um, when it is being lit, you light it up, the interior looks like a microcosm of heaven on earth. You look an entire, if you look, remember, if you look up, you can see all the cherubims and all the angels over there. All right? And you look around, you know, you see, you see, there's a show bread, there's a bread there, there's, a, there's an altar in front of you, all right? So you will see it's like, you know, a real mini microcosm of a heaven on earth. 
So those lampstands here, it will symbolize the light that shows the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. All right? Now, he is, Jesus is also called the light of the world, right? We sing the song, light of the world, you step down into darkness. Light of the world that is found in, in the Gospel of John, in John chapter 8, verse 12. If you've got time, you can read it. John chapter 8, verse 12. Um, it also represents, number second, number first, it represents the Lord Jesus. The, first, the second thing, it represents the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is also likened to the spirits or the seven spirits in the land or the light, okay? Um, he reveals to us salvation, okay? Because the Holy Spirit reveals or shine or illumine our mind so that the sinful men, they would be able to see the salvation of God, okay? So natural men by us, by human nature, fallen nature, we are blinded by sin. We are in the dark. Unless the Holy Spirit shines, or illumine our mind. So in addition to the presence and the salvation of the Lord, it gives the golden lampstand, it gives light for the service for the priest, for the priest to be able to serve inside. Okay? And that uh, they were ministering in a place, they were laboring in a place. So we will have the lampstand pointing to Jesus and his salvation, pointing to Christ and his salvation. All right? Now across from it, from the right, from the left side is this lampstand, here, opposite, directly opposite, you will see a table. The table is called a table of showbread. Okay, the table of showbread that looks something like this. All right? And uh, you can see, it's sometimes also called the bread of presence. The bread of presence on the right-hand side. It is also overlaid with gold. You can see everything is gold. Just now, the golden lampstand is also gold. This one is also gold. All right? And it had a crown, a kind of frame of gold that is around it. Okay, so this crown of frame that is around it. And on the table, there are 12 loaves of fresh bread. Nothing more, nothing less. Why 12? Because there are 12 tribes of Israel. Okay? It represents the whole of Israel. So the 12 loaves of fresh bread, two stacks. One side six, the other side is six. And they were placed there every Sabbath. Every Sabbath. And we are told that they are supposed to be eaten by the priests. Not by anybody. The priests only. And the law symbolized the 12 tribes and it provided a continual reminder of the everlasting promises and provision of the covenant of God. God in his covenant has given Israel, the promised people or the elect, the everlasting promises and his provision. All right, remember the word provision, remember the word promises. The ritual of presenting the bread is called a covenant forever. It's an everlasting covenant. Right? And this symbolizes God's people in God's presence. In the presence of God, in the hot spot where God's presence is, God dwells among his people. Now, this is where it is shown. The priests are also allowed to feed upon themselves. They are, uh, they are, they are allowed to feed upon themselves, eat there. And we, of course, we, for us, we must be fed by the living word, by the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is also known as the bread of life. He said that in John chapter 6, verse 35. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And he promised that those who feed upon him by faith, by trusting in him, will never go hungry. They will always have eternal life. All right? Now, the fifth item, now we come to the fifth one, which is in the center, right? One, two, and then the fifth one, huh? four. Third, fourth, and then fifth, this thing, huh? this thing over here, the square thing, is called the altar of incense. The altar of incense. Okay, I told you when you come into the tabernacle, you uh, it would be seen in the far right of the first room. Okay, sorry, not far right, far side of the first room. It's just immediate, immediately in front of you, right? But in the first room. And the altar with its horns, you can see horns here, okay? The four corners. Again, it is overlaid with gold, pure gold only. Okay, so the high priest would burn a special sweet incense, a recipe that is only reserved for this purpose. You cannot take the recipe and simply go and make your cologne, your perfume outside. Cannot. The recipe is not to be shared, only be used here in the tabernacle. So he burned the incense on the altar every morning and every evening. 
Okay, and then once a year on a special day called the Day of Atonement. Okay, it's a called the Day of Atonement. On a special day called the Day of Atonement, right? And you will see that the horns of the altar is going to be sprinkled with the blood of the sin offering. This one is not the altar of incense. This is the altar, the brazen altar that is outside. Okay, that's outside. All right. But this is what we, I just want you to see the Day of Atonement. But here, on the Day of Atonement, that time, uh, here, they will, he will sprinkle with the blood. Just now, the blood that is being sacrificed outside, uh, he will bring some of the blood and he will sprinkle it here on this altar. So usually, there is no sprinkling of the blood. Usually, every day, morning and evening is only to put incense, to burn incense, uh, to burn uh, incense. Uh. Okay, but then on the day of atonement, then yeah, they will take the blood that is outside sacrifice one, and then they will come in here and they will sprinkle. Okay, and it is all is uh is been done by the high priest. Now, what this what did this symbolize? Well, the incense represented the prayers offered before the mercy seat of God's presence. Okay, later I'll talk to you what is mercy seat, but for now I'll just register it first. Huh? It's an incense. That is being um, represented by the prayer offered before the mercy seat of God's presence. So if you are singing at the beginning of Psalm 141, and you will notice this, okay, because it speaks about our prayer rising up as the incense before the Lord. Okay, if you go to uh, Psalm 141, Psalm 141, verse 2, okay, I just read it for you from my Bible. Psalm 141, verse 2. You will see this. It says, May my prayer be set before you like incense. Okay? May my the lifting of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. Okay? So that is how it, 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 it symbolizes. Okay? Um, the book of Revelation actually also carry out this. It also says about this. Um, the same ceremonial symbol symbolism. In Revelations 5, 8, it says, When they had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense. What is the incense for? Which are the prayers of God's people. You see this? And then in chapter 8, um, verse 3 to 4, it says, Another angel who had golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer. What is the incense? With the prayers of all God's people. Once again, you see that. Okay, on the golden altar in front of the throne, right? So that is how you see that. And all of that has its origin right here in the altar of incense. And it teaches us that God desires our prayer and that he accepts our prayers through the mediation of Jesus Christ. How do we accept it? Because just now you came in, you have already made the atonement and you are already been purified through the Lord Jesus Christ and therefore he will accept our prayer only because Jesus is the perfect mediator between you and God. So these prayers rise before God's throne as a sweet-smelling incense. So you must almost imagine uh, when you come into the tabernacle, to the holy place, uh, everything is 5D, you know? Everything you can smell, you can hear, you can see, you can feel. Everything is coming to your senses, okay? Just like the incense rose before the Ark of the Covenant, which later we will see, and the mercy seat that is inside the most holy place. So it was before the altar of incense here also, uh, to worth notice, uh, in the later temple, not the tabernacle, that an angel appeared to the priest who is taking his duty at that time. His name is called Zechariah. Okay, so you see here, once Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as a priest before God, he was chosen by Lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshippers were praying outside. Do you see the word praying? Okay. So he came and prayed as a representative. And the angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah standing at the right side of the altar of incense. So why? Because the angel appeared there to announce to him that God has answered or has heard his prayers for a son. His son's name is John the Baptist. Okay, uh, sorry, John. Okay, his son's name is John. He's also known as the John the Baptist. And we read that in the opening line of uh, Luke. Okay, 
Now, the sixth item that I'm going to share with you and see is the veil, this veil over here. Now, there would have been a large veil that separates the holy place from the most holy place. This number three here is called the veil. Do you see that here? Number three, veil, right? All right. Now, this behind this altar of incense here was a veil, and this veil separates the two portions. It is a very visible and symbolic barrier between God and man. Okay, so if you are a priest, you will only come until this point. Okay, you cannot make yourself above or over this point. It was made of a very heavy woven cloth, very heavy cloth, and it is without an opening in the middle. You cannot come through the middle. You only can come through the side. All right? So once you are inside the Holy of Holies, the only item found there was this piece of thing, which is called the Ark of the Covenant. This whole thing is called the Ark of the Covenant. Why is it called an Ark of the Covenant? Because people can carry it on their shoulders by the priest. Now, this room itself over here is about 15 feet by 15 feet. Very, very small. Huh? 15 feet by 15 feet. The high priest only entered this Holy of Holies once a year. So this is a squarish place. All right. He only enters this Holy of Holies once a year. One time a year. Okay, one time a year. On the day, which day? On the day of atonement. Why? To sprinkle the blood on this piece of furniture called the mercy seat. So he sprinkle here and then he will come in and sprinkle here. And when he does that, it means it is an atonement for the sins of himself and for the sins of the people. So he come into this place knowing that his sin needs to be atoned for. And knowing that once his sin has been atoned for, he can atone for the sin of the other people that is waiting outside. And that's very, very important for understanding the significance of when the veil in the later temple was actually torn by God from top to bottom when Jesus died. If you read the Gospels, you will see this, I think in Matthew, okay, that it is being torn from top to bottom. When Jesus died at them on the cross, huh, this piece of veil huh, in the temple, in Herod's temple, in the second temple, it is being torn from top to bottom. When you see top to bottom, which means what? Now you can go through the middle way. Usually you cannot even pass through the middle. Now, usually you can only go through the sides, but now it's being passed through. You can go directly. So it symbolizes that every Christian, every believer is able to approach God directly. Why? Through the death of Jesus Christ. So you will note the connection between the Old Testament imagery in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Now, this whole piece is called the Ark of the Covenant. Later, I will talk to you more about this, okay? Later. Now, it says in Hebrews 4, 16, let us then approach God's throne of grace or God's throne of mercy, mercy seat, okay, with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So remember the mercy seat, to find grace and to help us in time of need. Now let's consider more of the Ark of the Covenant, which I said just now itself, and the mercy seat. Okay, which one is called the mercy seat? Now, this thing, this cover over here is called the mercy seat. Sometimes in modern translation, some of the translation says the atonement cover. This is called the atonement cover. This is also called the throne of grace. Okay, the mercy seat. All right. This entire thing is called the Ark of the Covenant. All right. Now, this, after all, was the final destination within the inmost sanctuary of God inside the tabernacle. And this gives us the central focus. It's like the hotspot of the hotspot of the hotspot. Therefore, it is a central of the central of the central focus. Most important part of the tabernacle as a whole is this part. The ark, of course, it was rectangular. You can see here, all right? Uh, by the way, uh, this one it may not look exactly like how it looks like. This is a little bit elaborated, uh, look a bit more artsy, but uh, it's more or less something like this. This is just a rendition version, all right? Um, it is covered with gold, as you can see, every place, everything is gold inside out. But when you come to the Ark of Covenant itself, 
the art uh, is full of all the clear descriptions that captures the presence of God. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 4, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 4, uh, this is also the art. You see that? The rendition is a little bit different. Uh, this whole piece upstairs is called the mercy seat. Okay? Now, in chap Hebrews chapter 9, verse 4, it says, um, which had the golden altar of incense, the gold covered ark of the covenant. This ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Okay, can you see gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff, and then the stone tablet of the covenant, which means that the tablet that Moses got from coming down from Sinai is being kept. These three items, the manna, the staff that has budded already, got bud already, and then the, uh, the two tablets put inside here. All right? It's kept inside there. Now, the mercy seat is actually made up of one piece of pure gold. This entire thing is one piece of pure gold, beaten gold. And it was set on top of the ark. And it had two winged cherubim, as you can see, cherubims on each side of it each facing each other with the wings that were outstretched above them towards each other. And so it's highlighting the primary purpose of the tabernacle as a whole. Elsewhere, this place is this particular partner, the mercy seat uh, is also called the throne of God. The throne of God. That's why just now you see the word throne of grace, right? Again, a tiny temporary picture of God's place in heaven. All right? You can see that God is transcendent. God is above everything. Okay? He is not even, you know, not even the heaven of heavens can contain him. All right? But then he chose to come down in the midst of his people, to dwell among his people. Okay? Pointing, of course, chiefly, mainly to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the word became flesh and dwell among, tabernacle among his people, right? With all these things in place, one more essential thing that still remains is the presence of God itself. The presence of God himself. The Lord manifests his mercy, his presence, sorry, in a cloud by day and in a pillar of fire by night. But it rested above the tabernacle, directly above the mercy seat. Which place? Is it in the, in the holy place? No, in the most holy place, directly above the mercy seat. So if you see the cloud, you will, you will know that that location, that place is where the mercy seat is over the ark. So God spoke to the high priest also above the mercy seat. God's presence led and directed his people through the wilderness. Okay, when the cloud or the pillar moved, Israel will move. They will not encamp there. When he stopped, then they were encamped there until it moved again. But the message was very clear that God was dwelling among them. Okay? Now, last but very importantly, we need to consider the heavenly realities. The heavenly realities that are found in the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle was a temporary earthly picture of God's true uh, resting place, true abode or true resting place. So since the tabernacle was a symbol of the Lord's home, while he dwelt among his people, so it had to be a true pattern of his real abode in heaven. Okay? So if you were uh, figuring out how does God look like in heaven, ah, then you look at the tabernacle, you can almost see a mini version, a very, 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 very mini version of how God is. Okay? So we have already come to it and see to the fact that the tabernacle, you know, we can draw the parallel that it was an earthly picture of heaven, right? God is in the midst, in the middle, okay? So remember the embroidered cherubim that you can see outside, okay? That is above you. And the colorful cloth that is covering the ceiling and the sides and the inside. The cherubim over the ark of the mercy seat just now, you see. So what happens in God's presence, in God's throne room in heaven? It is full of all these spiritual beings. Full of all these spiritual beings. Huh? That looks a bit unusual because they are winged. They have wings. They fly. And all these spiritual beings that God has created to serve Him. 
all right? Um, the, mini the, old, the Old Testament saints, uh, the Old Testament believers, they would understand that uh, it was built, uh, that what was built was only a model. It was a pattern of something that is more glorious, okay? So when they look at this, they would know that this is something that is uh, actually like a pattern, like a, what you call that? Uh, it's like a model, uh, you know, like when you do model that time, uh, uh, what 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 kind of uh, uh, you you model the the design? It's not really the real thing yet, you know, but it's just 